This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. In this edition of the Oncogene Brief, we talk with Dr. Mohamed Murtaza and Dr. Thomas Slavin about liquid biopsies. Dr. Murtaza is Assistant Professor and Co-Director of the Center for Non-Invasive Diagnostics at TGen in Phoenix, Arizona. And Dr. Slavin is Assistant Clinical Professor, Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research and Population Sciences, Division of Clinical Cancer Genomics at City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in Duarte, California. We specifically talk about a test called TARDIS which stands for Targeted Digital Sequencing. This test, according to a study published earlier this year, is as much as 100 times more sensitive than other blood-based cancer monitoring tests. TARDIS is a liquid biopsy that specifically identifies and quantifies small fragments of cancer DNA circulating in the patient's bloodstream, known as circulating tumor DNA. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brave. The Oncogene Brief is developed in collaboration with our online journal, Oncozine, at www.oncozine.com, where you can find additional information and the latest news about cancer, cancer diagnosis and treatment, and cancer prevention. Let's listen to the interview. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and how you became interested in, in diagnostics? Let me start with Dr. Murtaza. I have been at TGN for about four and a half years with a research lab that's focused on developing new technologies around the liquid biopsies concept and then and addressing sort of clinical gaps and applications using these new technologies. Before I came to TGN, I actually grew up in Pakistan. I went to medical school there and then I moved to uh, England to get a PhD uh, in cancer genomics. This was right around the, the dawn of the liquid biopsy era where people were starting to become interested. And what was really happening was sequencing technology was starting to become you know, more accessible and cheaper. And so we were starting to look beyond you just you know, your regular genomes into cancer genomes and then how much of those cancer genomes could you find from blood samples. And so that's sort of the, the, the birth of the liquid biopsy field. And my PhD was focused in that area. So that's how I ended up here running an entire program based on that. And, and now you're in Arizona. Okay, Dr. Slavin, what about your uh, background and how did you become interested in, in this particular uh, field? I'm a medical geneticist. Uh, I'm actually at three board certifications, medical genetics, uh, molecular diagnostics, which is lab-based uh, genetic testing, and then also uh, pediatrics, you know, just like Dr. Mirza. An interesting road to get here. I originally was always just interested in using uh, the potential of genetics to inform risk factors for individuals, try to keep people uh, disease-free. And as I was going through my residency at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, I started seeing that you could have immediate impact on people with particularly cardiovascular disease, people with cancer, and those were the two just kind of hot areas uh, to look into susceptibility genetics and keeping people and their family members safe from developing whatever disease may be afflicting them. I finished residency, went to the University of Hawaii, where I was a director of a hereditary cancer clinic there. We were doing genetic testing on individuals with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, uh, trying to find underlying cause of disease, try to help them and their family members, whether it be remove their ovaries to prevent ovarian cancer or do high-risk breast screening in these individuals. There's just a lot of applications, and it's just gotten even more exciting since then. I wanted to do more research. I came back to City of Hope uh, really to do that after some searching, and uh, this was just a, a very good fit for me because we have an extremely large hereditary cancer research registry at City of Hope. It's up to now 25,000 people. Uh, just uh, broke a new record uh, recently when right. we uh, broke, went over 25,000. This is an amazing resource. This work actually is really just piggybacked off of some of the development of that research registry. So now I'm a physician scientist. I actually am about 75% plus uh, research and uh, uh, see patients only about 25% of the time. 
patient population that I'm seeing is still, yes, women and men at high risk for developing cancer. I do follow some children as well that have cancer syndromes, and we do everything from management of screening for cancers in those groups uh, if they're high risk by whole body MRI and biomarkers and everything else. And then on the research side, I'm really interested still in, uh, yeah, preventative uh, genetics, so biomarkers, and this fits nicely in that. And uh, Dr. Mirza and I have been talking for uh, some years at this point, uh, developing this project, which really he obviously uh, has been the, the brains behind. And then I've just been thinking how we can uh, be opportunistic with our uh, research registry and join clin- clinical efforts between City of Hope and TGen. One of the things that, that was noteworthy in what you just mentioned is the fact that you are interested in making sure people stay disease free. I think that is absolutely fabulous. Unfortunately, in this world, that is not the case. So the next best thing is, I guess, is finding a way to diagnose them at a very early stage. And the TARDIS system that you're working with is one of the, or, or you're part of the developing team, is, I guess, is part of, of that approach to make sure that people can get early diagnosed. It's a blood test uh, for breast cancer, and it could help avoid thousands of unnecessary surgeries and otherwise precisely monitor disease progression, which is one of the key things in, in oncology. And TGen, City of Hope, and other institutions collaborated on this study that was published just recently in Science Translational Medicine. So that is is one of the things that you're working on. Now, f- before we're going to talk a little bit further about TARDIS, can you explain or can you tell me what, what TARDIS is further than a, a blood test and what the acronym actually stands for? TARDIS stands for Targeted Digital Sequencing. I think the title uh, nicely captures how the technology works. The idea is to take sequencing assays and really, in a very targeted fashion, look for a patient's mutations in a patient's own tumor and really digitally count every fragment that covers that region of the genome and see if we can actually measure the total contribution of the tumor in their blood samples. So that's sort of where the name comes from. It, of course, has a very futuristic ring uh, for any uh, fans of uh, Doctor Who as well and uh, captures some part of my training uh, in England. Right. Of course, when you talk about biopsies, and this is what they call then a liquid biopsy, there is a difference between the two, uh, between TARDIS, what the start is doing as a liquid biopsy and what other biopsies are doing. Can you tell me a little bit of the difference of the liquid biopsy and the biopsy and the superiority of, for example, liquid biopsies versus traditional biopsies? You know, I think looking at it in the framework of either or is, is, is uh, I think, somewhat misleading, probably. So, so we should, you know, we should consider what each one of these things offer uh, for the patient and how they may be useful in certain diagnostic scenarios, right? So a conventional tissue biopsy is and will remain for the foreseeable future the gold standard for diagnosis of cancer in a in a patient as far as we can so far see. And here's why. So you take a in a conventional tissue biopsy, you take a sample of the tumor depending on the tumor type, sometimes excise the, uh, whatever tumor you can, uh, you can get, either with a needle or you excise the whole tumor out. And the idea is to evaluate the tumor under the microscope with the various stains uh, and to really see the morphology, how the tumor cells are arranged in that tissue block and run additional sort of different kinds of genetic tests. The liquid biopsy is a term that's uh, really meant to capture the analysis of what different molecules, whether it's DNA uh, or RNA, sometimes uh, just cells of the tumor, shed into the bloodstream and if we can capture them in the blood. That doesn't automatically qualify a diagnosis of cancer, and it's hard to see how that will somehow replace tissue biopsies. I don't think it will. But what it does, what it can do is in patients, it can either identify patients who are very at very high risk of actually having tumors. And so you can confirm the diagnosis of the tissue biopsy. That's in the early detection setting. Or in a patient who's already been diagnosed, you can try to identify whether they have certain mutations or how well they're responding to treatment. And so those are some of the applications of liquid biopsies. But fair to say in summary that they are very likely to go hand in hand together to really give you a much better understanding of if this patient has cancer what does that cancer look like? What would be the right treatment regimen? And are these patients responding to these treatments? It's not an either or. It, it could be used in combination with. 
Absolutely. So talk a little bit about TARDIS and the TARDIS system. What makes it so unique if you compare that to, for example, other liquid biopsies? There, Almost every day or every week you look in, in either a medical journal or in a general journal in the media and you find information about liquid biopsies and, and different approaches. So what makes the TARDIS system so unique? So there are a number of applications of liquid biopsies for cancer patients, and they span really the entire spectrum. And that's why you see a lot of different developments across this uh, spectrum. So, you know, all the way from pre-symptomatic cancer patients, patients who don't have symptoms yet, but may have cancer, they don't know about it yet, where people are excited that potentially liquid biopsies could help with early detection uh, of cancer To somebody who has been diagnosed with cancer and you're asking the question, you know, what mutations does this patient's tumor have so we know what drugs to treat it with? And then as these patients get on to treatments, people are wondering whether changes in these mutation levels can somehow help you identify, you know, whether you're responding or not. So there's a whole host of applications. Let's take a break. And then we're back with our interview with Dr. Mohamed Murtaza, Assistant Professor and Co-Director of the Center for Non-Invasive Diagnostics at TGen in Phoenix, Arizona, and Dr. Thomas Slavin, Assistant Clinical Professor, Departments of Medical Oncology, Therapeutic Research, and Population Sciences, Division of Clinical Cancer Genomics at City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center in Duarte, California. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngers in Brave. You listen when your body says, I'm tired, or I'm hungry. What if your body said something else might be wrong? Gynecologic cancers, cervical, ovarian, and uterine cancers have symptoms, so pay attention. If your body says something may be wrong, please listen. Learn the symptoms. Get the inside knowledge about gynecologic cancers. A message from HHS and CDC's Inside Knowledge Campaign. Did you know that generic drugs are just as safe and effective as brand name drugs? Generics might look different, but they work the same way. And they can even save you money. Don't believe me? Ask your doctor or pharmacist. Or visit FDA.gov slash generic drugs. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. TARDIS addresses one very uh, unique area here, which is patients who have early stage disease, so that's not metastatic yet. And the goal of treatment is to try and cure these patients, right? To try and get rid of all the disease, whether it's through chemotherapy or surgery or radiation, try to get rid of the disease uh, as much as possible. That's the group of patients that we're addressing with TARDIS. The overall approach is once a patient is diagnosed, they get a tumor biopsy. We get a piece of that tumor biopsy and sequence that for the entire exome. That's looking across all 20,000 or so genes and trying to see what is the collection of mutations in each patient's tumor. And then we develop a blood test that's tailored for every patient's own mutation. So we look at dozens of those mutations simultaneously in their blood samples. And now you can think of this as, you know, a repeatable test that's individualized, tailor-made for each patient. So now you can look at a blood sample before they get treatment and as they get on to treatment and at the end of treatment and see whether they responded to that treatment and whether there's any evidence of disease that's left at the, at the end of that treatment. That's the overall model that uh, the TARDIS uses. And as a result of this patient-specific tailor-made testing, we can be uh, a lot more sensitive and a lot more accurate in our assessment of circulating uh, tumor DNA, which is you know, d- DNA shed from the tumor. So the, the TARDIS system, you're using the concept of, of, of liquid biopsy, but then basically put it uh, on its head by making it a very personal, uh, individualized test only for that particular patient. That's right. So we're basically uh, we are, we are implementing a tumor-guided individualized test for each patient to look at their circulating tumor DNA levels. And that makes it obviously a considerably different test than the off-the-shelf kind of liquid biopsies that may be available today or in the future. The majority of testing that's commercially available today is actually geared towards identifying mutations directly from plasma. And those don't achieve this, a similar level of sensitivity that TARDIS can achieve. 
they're also focused on advanced metastatic cancer patients, where the question is, you know, does this patient's tumor have the mutations that we could target with a drug? Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the sensitivity. Dr. Slaven, if you look at the TARDIS system and you compare that to the cancer monitoring tests, what's the difference in, in, for example, the sensitivity? This is very different in the sense that this is personalized oncology. So it's really a test made for one individual and it allows you a lot more power, you know, when you go looking for those types of variants flowing around in that person's bloodstream, because essentially you now know exactly what you're looking for. You've already found the needle in the haystack, essentially, from the tumor, and now you're just going to look in the person's blood and see if that uh, variant is still there. And then, you know, what what his team has done has uh, been to then layer on multiple uh, mutations or variants that are novel to the tumor, and and that increases even further the ability to detect the circulating tumor better uh, floating around in the bloodstream. It is very unique in that sense and different than what others are doing because when other platforms are looking for uh, variants floating around in somebody's blood, they're really just looking at usually just common tumor mutations, mutations that are in certain well-described genes and a handful of genes, and they're trying to see if those are floating around. One of the big confounders of that is that when you find that variant, if, if you do find that variant, one, Even though it might be something common to tumors, there could be some other reason that person has that exact mutation floating around in their blood. And those could be everything from that you actually did find that person's cancer or you are monitoring or tracking that person's cancer. But it could also be that uh, that person developed leukemia and maybe you're actually looking at somebody's leukemia, not actually the cancer. Or maybe that it's these kind of pre-leukemic blood clones, which we call clonal hematopoiesis, which are when your blood system puts out different clones after all the dividing throughout life. So as, as people get older in life, actually it's very common to see some percentage of our blood cells not all match up. The genetics are actually different as we age. That can be fine, but sometimes it can actually be pre-leukemic or possibly a um, flag for even cardiovascular disease as some of the current uh, hot research is showing. So all these make it very difficult then to try to identify you know, tumor mutations from some of these other potential confoundings. I mean, also you can have false positives. I mean, you could even have mutations that happen in the blood tube after the uh, samples drawn from a person if it's been sitting around for a while. So all of this is very confusing and really decreases your ability to know for sure that you're talking about uh, cancer when you see it. But uh, the TARDIS method is different because you start with something that you already know exactly what you're looking for. So when you see it, it's not really a surprise. It just confirms that there's still some tumor floating around because that exact mutation has now been seen in the tumor and you're seeing in that person's plasma. Let's widen out a little bit about that. And it's like that when you look, for example, with a target system, you look specifically at breast cancer. In the introduction, I refer to the fact that using the TARDIS system or the test may ultimately lead to fewer unnecessary surgeries. Now, if you look at what you're doing and how relevant is that if you compare that to what happens today? The first clinical study that we evaluated the performance of TARDIS and after we tested it in sort of reference samples to really see how how sensitive, how much more sensitive it could be and, you know, look at the limit of detection, we actually looked at if it could report something of clinical value. And the context for this study was early stage non-metastatic breast cancer patients. So this was a study that was a collaboration between ourselves at TGEN, and uh, with Tom at the City of Hope and our partners at Mayo Clinic in Arizona and at the University of Cambridge. So what we looked at was women with breast cancer who were getting treated with what's called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this is Mm -hmm. basically chemotherapy that they're receiving before they're getting surgery so that their tumors can be, uh, you know, uh, shrunk in size for an easier uh, operation with better outcomes. What's interesting in these women is that up to 30% of them, after they've had neoadjuvant therapy, when they get surgery, what you remove where you thought the tumor was, there's actually no evidence of the tumor in the tissue that was resected. So if you look at the tissue under the microscope, there's no evidence of tumor cells anymore. That's about 30% of women. So what we wondered in the clinical study was if we took a blood sample before treatment, and then we took a blood sample after neoadjuvant therapy before surgery, right, and ran TARDIS on it, would we be able to tell who is going to get complete response to neoadjuvant therapy and have no evidence versus somebody who will have residual disease? And so that was the premise of the study. And what we found 
was uh, there is about a six-fold difference in the circulating tumor DNA levels at the end of neoadjuvant therapy. So, for example, the women who have residual disease have circulating tumor DNA levels are six-fold higher than those who have complete response. And many of them are negative. The ones who have complete response, some of them have complete clearance, some of them may have trace levels of ctDNA left. And so that's where, with further validation, uh, of course, you know, in a larger cohort, which we are working on right now, we're working on a 200-patient study right now to really apply the same concept and validate our findings uh, in, a, in a much more representative uh, cohort of patients. If it stands to validation, then uh, the implications of this are that, and of course, this needs to be tested in clinical trials, but the implications of, of this are that we could potentially avoid surgery altogether in patients who have excellent response. Like I said, this is perhaps a few studies away to ensure this, this will stand clinical uh, trial muster, but we're working on them now. But that's definitely the goal of where you are taking TARDIS. To. I think that's definitely one application of where TARDIS could be very useful uh, in, in this, these patients, not just in breast cancer, but across the cancer types that are getting uh, these preoperative systemic uh, chemotherapies and having an excellent response. They can, you know, at minimum help you plan the extent of surgery, uh, you know, if not avoid it altogether. You mentioned uh, circulating tumor DNA. For our audience, if you uh, look at DNA, they, they often hear the term DNA. But when you're looking at, at circulating tumor DNA, they may not necessarily always understand what we were talking about. Can you explain a little bit how we, what this is and, and, and how this actually fits in with the test that you are developing? Yes, so the test, what we are measuring is circulating tumor DNA. Let's take a, a step back and, and, and define it uh, a little bit. So for Almost six decades, we've realized that if you take a blood sample and, uh, you know, you look outside of the cells, you get rid of the cells, there is DNA fragments floating around in what's called cell-free plasma. We've known that for almost six decades, but for the last two decades, we've started to realize that if that plasma sample was taken from a pregnant mother, then a fraction of that DNA is actually shed by the, by the fetus. Mm -hmm. And in a cancer patient, a fraction of the DNA is shed by the tumor. And that DNA, that fraction is what's called circulating tumor DNA. The way we identify it to be tumor specific is because it carries the same mutations, the, the, the mutations we just talked about. So that's the, that's the context of the, of the testing itself. That's what we're trying to measure, circulating tumor DNA, or uh, Tom and I may refer to it as ctDNA. And using that, and I'm going back to the fact that you can avoid unnecessary uh, surgery, is that using this knowledge, uh, seeing the, you, you, you can you can figure out whether a patient needs surgery or not, whether they are still ha are can have cancer or don't. That is basically the role of the circulating t uh, tumor DNA can tell you. Right. So the challenge here is that as the tumor size gets smaller and smaller, and it, if the patient has an excellent response, the levels of circulating tumor DNA in blood will become fewer and fewer. Right? Fewer and fewer molecules will become trace amounts of, of, of circulating tumor DNA to pick up. So it's very, very, very small amounts that you need to pick up. And that's where we've tried to leverage the multiple mutations in each patient's tumor, sometimes hundreds to be really, really sensitive for these low levels. So it seems like our data set suggests that we have achieved a level of sensitivity that helps us distinguish these patients. What we're testing now is this, is this level of sensitivity adequate to decide which patients may not need any further surgery versus those who will probably benefit from additional treatment? That remains an open question uh, for clinical study that we're, that, that we're performing right now. Let's take a break. And then we're back with our interview with Dr. Murtaza and Dr. Slavin. Each day, researchers make discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Their progress is made possible with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. Oh. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo.
If you're just joining us, this week we talk with Dr. Mohamed Murtaza and Dr. Thomas Slavin about a powerful liquid biopsy, a blood test called TARDIS, which is as much as 100 times more sensitive than other blood-based cancer monitoring tests. One of the things that you uh, you often hear in diagnostic tests, but uh, one of the promises or one of the basically negate the, 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 the promises of a lot of, of liquid biopsies was the fact that too often there were so-called false positives or false negatives, meaning that people were either diagnosed as having a disease or diagnosed as not having the disease while having the disease. So uh, often very complex and that is, of course, a concern to the clinicians uh, and to the patients. And, and it also impacts the, the way you look at how a patient needs to be treated or maybe can avoid treatment. If you look at the TARDIS system, you already know that a patient has cancer uh, because you actually, I mean, it's a different way of looking at, 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 at this whole process. But are there still issues with false positives and false negatives that you may encounter or, or uh, deal with? So this is exactly where the larger clinical study is going to be very helpful. That's what we are conducting right now. So the way we, the way uh, you know, you uh, think about false positives and negatives is uh, by thinking about diagnostic thresholds on what you're measuring, right? So we're what we're measuring is a quantity, and you know we'll have some measurement of circulating tumor DNA. In some cases, it'll be negative, but you know in most cases we'll have a, a measurement, right? And the real question you're asking is at what level do you think that we should continue with further treatment or at what level do you think, below what level do you think can you, you know, avoid treatment altogether? Those are questions that, to answer those questions, this first patient study was a proof of principle that looked at 30 patients. So to answer the kinds of questions that you're asking, I think we need the, the much larger study. In the first instance, it's going to be 200 patients, and then, but we may need a larger sample size than even that to, to really get at it at, with, with clinical muster. But that's uh, generally the direction we're headed in and where we still need to see the real-world clinical performance of the test. The answer is still in, in, in the open. It's still not, uh, you, it's not clear yet. Our data is very promising, which is why we're excited uh, in pursuing this further. But before we can start using it clinically, we need to um, get through with the studies that are ongoing right now. Obviously, what we discussed in, in this program right now so far is the fact that this test is very personal. Um, it's individualized on the on the person that we are uh, de- dealing with, um, the patient, right? Personalization of medicine is is often something that we are talking about in in media. It's often uh, spoken about on medical conferences. Uh, with, for example, and, and, and European Society of Medical Oncology has a lot of presentations about liquid biopsies and, and the technology down there. Same thing with the American Society of Clinical Oncology coming up with San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. There is no doubt a lot of information about the the, the benefit and the usability of of uh, personalized medicine and and liquid biopsies. If you look at the total area of, of this, the personalization of medicine, the individual approach to medicine, how is that going to not only change the way we look at cancer and, and, and the treatment of cancer, but how do, how do we benefit from that? And how can we make that is something that really changes the future of cancer care? Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time. You know, these uh, technologies are, uh, of liquid biopsies are really just spanning the, you know, the spectrum of, uh, you know, pre-cancer and the potential for early detection. There's a huge race going on to try to, for companies to be the first to really have a marketable early detection test that shows some clinical utility uh, and can look at the average American or person in the world, really, and uh, try to identify if uh, they have a cancer uh, with a low false positive rate, ideally, which is not an easy thing to do when you don't start with knowledge of the cancer a priori. Identifying the cancer, I mean, yeah, there's there's uh, even potential here for uh, maybe even biopsies are not needed if uh, somebody has a good enough uh, circulating tumor test in the beginning, especially for, uh, you know, I think of uh, community centers, places that might not have access to a, a someone that could do a biopsy or a particular in um, uh, cancers of unknown primary where you don't even know where the original cancer was. I mean, th- that's where liquid biopsies have the potential to really shine to be able to maybe uh, identify uh, what's the most likely uh, cancer of origin or like in community settings with uh, limited access to care or worldwide with limited access to care, what kind of cancer is it and possibly even finding targets in the beginning or uh, understand uh, more about, uh, you know, how aggressive this type of cancer is uh, right from the beginning. And maybe you could go uh, directly to treatment instead of even 
going into a biopsy phase. Then there's, uh, you know, things like uh, the, the paper at hand that we're discussing, you know, okay, so now someone has cancer, you know, how can you use that liquid biopsy information, you know, in the setting of their actual uh, immediate cancer treatment with neoadjuvant chemotherapy or trying to figure out who developed a, a pathologic uh, complete response mm-hmm. uh, versus uh, residual disease. And then afterwards, yeah, how do you monitor someone? If you knew exactly the type of mutations in the original cancer, you know, that's a very powerful tool for long-term monitoring for decades of that person's uh, existing life to make sure that, uh, you know, you're on top of it if liquid biopsy results uh, turn positive for their old uh, suspect cancer. You know, there's studies that have been really kind of trickling out over the last uh, few years showing uh, that, yeah, you can you know, likely see circulating tumor DNA emerge well before imaging can pick up anything. So it is a very powerful screen and surveillance technique and early detection. So it it's really uh, has a lot of strong potential. One other thing we were looking at recently, how then you can layer in other technologies like proteins and RNA and exosomes and right. you know, how all these can complement circulating tumor DNA testing ultimately to try to hopefully decrease false positive rates, which would be uh, the, the, one of the more scary things, particularly for early detection. Right. So there, there's a lot of development ongoing. Now, if you look at um, the TARDIS test uh, as it is on hand, as it is uh, described in the uh, the paper that we were talking about, you're looking at a clinical trial that actually is going to involve more patients. That's That's the first step. When you go beyond that, when you look at, the, for example, the regulatory process and when this may be available for uh, a general audience, p- patients in general or doctors to use this with their patients, where are we talking about? Is this How far out is this? So for any biomarker uh, that you develop, there are usually three different steps that you have to go through before it can become something uh, that can be used clinically. And those uh, steps generally, they don't always follow this order, but the three steps are looking at its analytical validation, looking at its clinical validation, and then a third thing is looking at its clinical utility. And so what you're basically saying is making sure, analytical validation is making sure that your test can accurately measure the analyte you think it can measure. Right. And that's sort of a it's, a, it's a it's a process that you have to go through to ensure for regulatory bodies that that's happening. Before that or after that, there's the clinical validation, which is basically saying you're measuring something of clinical value. And then the third thing is, if that is the case, if you're measuring something that is related to some some something else that we're interested in clinically, then if I change my decision based on that, do we have better outcomes? Right? Uh, do we have, or we, or we at least similar outcomes depending on the context? So those are the three steps that we have to go through. Right now, what we've done with TARDIS is shown the proof of principle that this is, you know, a highly sensitive test that seems to be measuring something of clinical value in this small set of patients that we've looked at. We're now going through the process in this larger study uh, in breast cancer and additional studies elsewhere that we are sort of uh, in various stages of to show that the initial signal that this is something of clinical value is is valid. So we're going through the clinical validation process as we're we're going through right now. In the meanwhile, we'll be looking at analytical validation as well so that we can actually set up a test that you can actually do something based on. Right. So if the results, if we run that test for a patient, you can actually use those results clinically. So that would be sort of the next step is analytical validation. And then finally, the you know, the, the, the answer to the question, well, when it will be, it be, it be ready clinically, that's dependent on some of these steps, but then also the clinical trials where we change a decision in a patient based on these outcomes or based on these results, and we can show that the outcomes are good or the outcomes are not worse. For example, if we, for, if we uh, you know, hold back surgery from someone, we're not harming anybody, or are in some patients, we're getting, getting extra treatment and doing a good job. That's happening for other ctDNA tests, but that's sort of the pathway for, for TARDIS to go forward. And at that point, hopefully we can convince insurance companies in Medicare that this is something they may want to pay for, which is when it becomes clinically available for the wider patients. That's sort of the long answer. In terms of the timeline, we're going through this process you know, as we speak and expect that this test would be closer to clinic in the two to five year window. And this is this will vary for different cancer types and indications, but that's roughly the timeline we're working against. It will take some time, but if you look towards the future, you do believe that there will be a day that this can be routinely used to monitor patients uh, in cancer treatment and discover if they need additional treatment or if they actually are in remission, cured, cancer-free. 
that's basically something that you will expect uh, to see. We absolutely believe that's the direction to go in, and we are invested and working very hard to make that possible in two to five years. Let's let's move on a little bit from TARDIS. And um, if you look at the technology being used in the future of diagnostics and ultimately in the delivery of care, there are a lot of, of diagnostics tests out there. There are a lot of, of, of tests that's actually not only looking at what you're doing, but on the other side of the treatment area, tests that are being used, whether a particular drug has an effect on people, especially if you look at very targeted treatments like the so-called pdl ones or the checkpoint inhibitors or look at antibody drug conjugates. They are so, so very specific to treatment that the FDA requires that in order for a patient to get some of these, these particular treatment options, there is a requirement of what they call a companion diagnostic test. Does TARDIS is, is it in your vision, is that when you when you look at, at the, the clinical trial, the clinical development, that you not only can tell whether a patient is cancer-free or is has cancer or need additional treatment, that you also can look at the effect of a particular drug or whether a patient may benefit from a particular treatment? Is that also where you're going to take TARDIS? The way TARDIS is designed is, as we described earlier, a very tumor-guided approach where the identification of these mutations is actually performed on the tumor first. And then we use that information and leverage that data to have a high sensitivity test in plasma. So TARDIS itself is very focused on treatment monitoring, and I think that's the best application uh, for this test. Some of the, uh, the applications you're describing where you're trying to identify mutations in blood, whether it's because you can give them a targeted therapy or you're looking at mutation burden, that wouldn't be the right scope of application for TARDIS. There's, of course, other uh, strategies that you know uh, we're developing. Some of them are commercially available today. Some that we are developing ourselves that are uh, potentially likely to have an impact there. The best application for TARDIS is treatment monitoring, particularly in non-metastatic cancer patients. And that's a, that's a space that other technologies haven't been able to address yet because of limited detection challenges. And so I think that's where we've made the best, best advance. Let's take a break. And then we're back with our interview with Dr. Murtaza and Dr. Slavin. Over the years, you've brought opioids into your home. They helped when you were in pain, and you held on to them just in case. But holding on to opioids puts your family at risk. Learn more at www.fda.gov slash drug disposal. Are you thinking about buying medicine online? A search for online pharmacies yields more than 20 million results. But which ones can you trust? Medicines bought from unlicensed online pharmacies can be dangerous. You may get a fake drug, your condition may get worse, or you may experience a bad reaction. Don't put your health at risk. To learn how to find an online pharmacy that's safe and legal, visit fda.gov slash besaferx. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. This is the Alcazine Brief with Peter Hofflin and Sonia Portillo. And welcome back. I'm Peter Hofflin, and this is the Alcazine Brief. And, and, and when you look at TARDIS, it actually does things that other tests can't do in that respect. Is that correct? That's what the preliminary data suggests, yes. So if you look at neoadjuvantly treated patients, or let's look at early stage cancer patients, for starters, our detection rate in early stage cancer patients was 100%, which is above what has been shown previously. But then after neoadjuvant therapy, where we described, you know, that we can actually tell these patients apart after, you know, chemotherapy, we can tell apart whether they have residual disease or not. In that very particular setting, most tests will show all patients are negative or nearly 90% of the patients are negative. So that's why we think we have enabled clinical applications that were previously not possible because of limit of detection challenges. Dr. Murtaza, when you look at, at uh, often the, the language being used, and in, in, sometimes it's confusing. So when you look at a clinical trial, the term clinical trial, or cl the term clinical application, um, you've mentioned it a couple of times. Can you explain a little bit of the difference between the two? Sure. Overall goal of all of this effort that we are making with TARDIS is to advance precision medicine and the precision management of cancer patients so that every cancer patient 
will receive just the right drug and just the right amount of treatment to really uh, get them to cure, and we will minimize the adverse effects. And that's sort of where I think TARDIS uh, is, is trying to fit into one part of that precision medicine model. The different studies that you need to do before uh, you can take this into routine clinical application, one of the studies that we're working on right now um, is uh, a, really a, an observational uh, trial where you enroll patients who continue to get standard of care therapy. But what you are doing is you're collecting blood samples alongside those you know, standard of care treatment and trying to see whether your measurement would have helped you make a better decision in some of these patients. That's the first sort of the clinical validation study that we were talking about. Then there's the clinical trial where after the clinical validation study, in a future study now, what you do is you measure the biomarker in real time and try to make a decision based on that. And then you follow these patients and see whether you made a better decision. And that's a clinical utility trial the, you know, the, the second kind of study. If that trial stands out, that's when, you know, if that's a trial, the results of that trial are encouraging. That's when you can begin to uh, move towards uh, routinely offering that, this test uh, clinically because there's a randomized trial based on your uh, biomarker that has helped with outcomes. So those are sort of some of the different uh, studies that we need to go through uh, in, in clinical terms. So in, in, in summing up, I mean, basically the clinical trial is, is, is more or less the kind of studying whether it's, it has merit. And when you talk about the clinical application, that's the next phase when, when your questions, your, your, your ideas about what, what, what potentially may be the case can be actually translated in something that you can use in the, in, in the clinic to treat or help patients. That would be fair, yeah. And then there's really the implementation <laughs> of all of this, and that's, you know, assimilating all of the knowledge that's out there, you know, on the topic, you know, trying to, um, you know, see if it is uh, making a difference on outcomes, having that evaluated by usually uh, some types of uh, expert review committees, uh, guideline committees that um, start endorsing uh, your methodology and then uh, that ultimately, at least in the U.S., tends to be the main influencer on whether companies will, uh, you know, then cover the test or not uh, on the insurance side, uh, which is a lot of how testing is uh, completed. Because uh, obviously, this, at least as it stands right now, this would be very expensive testing. Uh, so uh, to have it integrated into uh, healthcare is a, a you know, very deep systems issue, and uh, yes, will take a long time and have to go through multiple steps. Now, that goes actually to the question of accessibility for patients and, and of course, whether patients can actually afford it. But it may be a, a loaded question in that particular case. If you can avoid, for example, 30% or, or an estimate made it in, in, in what we discussed earlier in the program, the potential to not have to sur have a surgical intervention in about 30% of the patients, then this test may be relatively expensive, but does not it save a lot of money and as a result, it does not make it more affordable. Um, and is this not really an incentive to really include this in potential reimbursement? Yeah, um, it's hard to see, you know, you know, coming down in price, uh, you know, it's going to be some time before these kind of technologies are uh, at that stage anyways, ready to be implemented because of all the steps we just discussed. I will say uh, that uh, we already have an example, though, of liquid biopsy circumventing uh, a procedure, which is uh, non-invasive prenatal testing, has uh, uh, really reduced substantially the amount of amniotes and TCs going on in this country, uh, at least in the United States. I mean, I, I personally, I have uh, never really seen a technology grab foothold as quickly as non-invasive prenatal testing. And the uh, the effect that it has had on decreasing substantially the amount of amniocentesis procedures. I mean, it's it's completely changed the cost structure of uh, prenatal uh, genetics and uh, allowed for some uh, very large companies to to spring up to offer non-invasive prenatal testing. So I have personally no doubt that this would uh, ultimately be similar. Yes, if it could be used to decrease uh, surgeries or take the place of, uh, it's not like imaging is inexpensive in itself. I mean, uh, as everyone knows, uh, you know, MRIs are extremely expensive and out-of-pocket costs for uh, those types of procedures are uh, not really 
attainable for uh, most uh, individuals without health insurance. So this would be, I think, a, a likely follow a similar suit. Right. So in, in one way, yes, uh, the test may be expensive. In the other way, avoiding interventions that really are no longer necessary is a good argument to include a test like this um, in, in when this becomes available, uh, which may, what we t we're talking about, take maybe a few years um, still in development, but definitely a good argument to consider. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. It was definitely a very instructional kind of uh, or informative kind of uh, program. Um, and, and thank you very much for your, um, for your help today and participation today. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for having us on. Having having TARDIS, which stands for Targeted Digital Sequencing, is a liquid biopsy. As you've heard in this program, this test is, according to a study published earlier this year, as much as 100 times more sensitive than other blood-based cancer monitoring tests. For more information about TARDIS, visit the website of TGen at www.tgen.org. For us here at the Youngers in Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors, and advertisers, for your ongoing support. Your support makes it possible that you can hear this program via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. And you can listen to the Uncas in Brief via PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And download our program via podcast and stream media, including iTunes and Spotify. For more information about supporting the Uncas in Brief, check our online journal Oncuzine at www.oncuzine.com. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, Text the word CANCER, C-A-N-C-E-R, to 66866, and we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all, and thank you for listening, and join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief was produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofflin, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949-923-923. 1660 or visit our website at oncazine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health if you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.